Tony, you need no introduction. Everybody <laughs> knows you. <laughs> and here we've been waiting with bated breath to, <laughs> to hear your words. And of course, what we would like to do is to plunge right in. Okay. I want to know from you, what do you feel is most important for us to recognize about Asperger versus autism? How, how would you define the difference? What, what's the most important aspect of it that you want to give it give to us? Can we come at that first? Is that possible? Okay. Yeah, you, you raise a very interesting and a question. I see what we call autism spectrum disorders as a continuum, a little bit like the continuum of visual impairment, from those who are blind to those like me who need glasses. Now, technically. I have just made myself Asperger's. Eustacia, I can see your face where it is, but I can't read your facial expressions. Okay? What we need with Asperger's is to put a pair of glasses on. Ah, it's clear. So it's the sort of subtleties that can be difficult for those with Asperger's. And the contrast is they have intellect, but don't necessarily have the neural structures to process social information. I think those with more classic autism have additional problems as well of learning difficulties, language problems, and so on. So I see it as part of a, of a continuum. And um, there are certain common aspects, at such as sensory sensitivity, but there's also the severity of expression. Severity of expression? Uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, fill me uh, out. Okay, it, it means that in, in what we call sort of classic Leo Canner's autism, all the characteristics are to a much stronger degree. Uh, okay. It's and just within more. Asperger, okay, it, it's just, it's to a lesser degree. And uh, what's in, interesting from my perspective, which I think people need to start to explore, is yes, I'm involved with diagnosis, but I'm actually becoming involved with undiagnosis. That is... If you look at the severity of expression that's needed for a diagnosis, I sometimes see teenagers and adults who, with early intervention and support, are now technically within the normal range. So there are certain families and individuals that I see that I say, you are now sub-threshold. If you walked in today and we assess the degree of ASD features, you wouldn't have enough for a diagnosis. So I'm seeing some that progress out of Asperger's syndrome. That's fascinating. I didn't, and that's wonderfully encouraging. Mm. Just, do you think they've had to learn it by rote? Do you think they've begun? See, what I keep wondering is, does the neurology grow? Because, yes. yes. I, I, I think so. It, it's, it's like completing a 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle that eventually you get an idea of, of where all the pieces fit and then very quickly it all fits together. What I do is I look at what has been the predictor of successful outcome. There are a number of features. The first is, is support and acceptance from a parent. So in other words, to feel that you are valued and loved for who you are which gives you the inner strength to go ahead and do what you need to do. I think that's very important. Oh, I Second, think um, Yeah, I think I, 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 Kathy Lord has spoken of this because she's been troubled by where, where she has run into uh, severe autism. The, the, you must love your child just the way they are. If you give the child the message that they could be improved, that's not a comfortable message. That makes a child feel... Uh, uh, that they're, they're not living up to what they're supposed to be. Yes, I, I think the child feels, I never met your expectations and I'm a failure. Yes. And that can either make them depressed or angry, which actually adds to the autistic behaviours. Yes, it does. But a, another thing that I've looked at as successful is to have, at some stage in childhood, a friend. That is yeah. someone yeah. who's outside the family Except, you know, that friendship may only last a few months or maybe a few years, but it is just to feel that somebody did accept you and value you because it was their choice rather than they were a paid therapist. 
I think you're absolutely right. I, I think of Temple when she was a little girl. Uh, she got accepted into the neighborhood because she was fun, because she had mm. good ideas, because she made kites for everybody. Yes. And they, they found her imaginative yes. and included her. And then she, in her turn, said, well, I found I had to play the games by their rules. Otherwise, they wouldn't let me play the game with them. Yes, it was but that was her sort of while to accept the rules. Yeah, and I think that the third dimension. Sorry, the third dimension is is the personality of the person themselves. Who is the person with ASD? Some surrender to it and stay in their little shell. Others decide, sometimes of their own accord, I'm going to be constructive or positive about this. I can't stay like this forever. I've got to do something about it, and it's what I call being incredibly brave as a personality characteristic. And I think that's important. Yes, yeah, so and well, now you're talking about character. Mm, and yes. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm jumping, but I, I'm so curious about it, and I don't know exactly whether we should start, whether I should save it to the end, but I'm not. I'm going to get ready. I, Uta Frith, who we talked to not so very long ago, I... I understand that you studied with her. I want to know, how did you come together? How did you find each other? And what do you value most <laughs> okay. that you learned well, from Uda? Okay, well, I started my interest in autism when I was 19 years old and, and wow. went to a special school and, and met two autistic children way, way back in 1971 and decided that was going to be my career. So from then on, I read every book from 1971 onwards uh, I actually have all the copies of the Journal of Autism and Develop um, anyway, JAD, uh, right. right from the beginning as a student, as I actually um, subscribed to it, but wanted to go and do clinical psychology because I wanted to help rather than study. And so my idea was to be a clinician to understand and help the kids. But I knew I needed to get professional qualifications at PhD level. And so I went to Lorna Wink, who died this year oh, and I about, that, yeah. okay, I talked to Lorna about what to do and I was interested in the social dimension and she said ah the person you need to contact is Uta Frith and she made that introduction and that's where it all began oh. and Uta is amazing because what, what we need in autism is people with the mind of Uta Frith because yes. she's, she, she has such insight and clarity and she's so perspective that her perspective is is theory of mind but it's her yeah. own mind that i find extraordinary well i think it's the combination of she's a delight to be with i treasure yeah. friendship with her and that's part of it and and you see both of you and i this is why i'm attracted to to this is involving the social aspects, uh, not the bio neurology, but who are we as human beings? Mm -hmm. uh, and that autism is very old. We've always had it. And somehow we either swept these children into life with us. I think it probably was easier in a farm because you say, no, he doesn't talk, but we, he milks the cows. Yeah. Uh, but uh, order is wonderfully Charming, dear, these words all sound shallow, but it's not shallow. She's, mm. You're right. She's absolutely right about things. And so are you. You both are looking at who are we as social creatures. Yes. And that is what, what I'm interested in. Obviously, I'm not a clinician, but I figure I will study all I can study and try to bring light to that, insight to it. Yes. And, and I think this is where there's a degree of, of compassion that occurs with Uta that's quite extraordinary. So it, she's not seeing the person of autism as a subject for a research study. She's trying to work out how does that person think, feel and so on. And this is where I think we've, we've explored the social, but I think we also need to explore the personality and the feelings of that person. And I found many with um, autism spectrum disorders are incredibly kind people, actually. Once they know you've got a problem, they can be great in helping you. 
That's an interesting point. I, because you see, I find it, it, it's a lot of times it's the mothers that I'm talking to and they're having a struggle. So mm-hmm. I identify with their struggle because I had my struggle. So mm-hmm. I know the road they've traveled. Uh, and autism throws the family off and therefore mm-hmm. they cannot be the people they think they are. I, I see that. Uh, I keep saying a baby needs a mother to know she's a baby, but a mother needs a baby to know she's a mother. And if my child does not know who I am, who am I? That's what I keep running into, which is social and is also character. Some people can come through it. Some people are are collapsing under it. Okay. I I think you you broached a a topic that I think needs to be explored further, and that is the effect of having – a child with ASD, Asperger's in particular, on yes, the mother. And I think it brings out a strong protective instinct towards the child with ASD. Now, often the mother is criticized for being overprotective, but I think the mother is the first person who's sensitive to this child's difference, even in infancy. And I think what's occurring is that that changes the mother's perception and interaction with the child seeing things that others don't see, but then supporting that person. Well, it it also seems to change her identity. She merges into her child. And I don't know that that's always a good idea. Uh, I, I think that's one of the issues is that protection can lead to a lack of independence of that person. Because I, I think if I go to it in a bit more depth, mom is very sensitive to that child's challenges. And when that child gets upset or confused, she really feels it. Yes. So both are feeling it together. So they're working together to try and create an easier lifestyle for both of them. But that may lead to a mutual dependency that the child feels, I don't need to try because mum will be there to do it for me. And Ah, that means the child uh, is inhibited in independence. Well, th- yep. I, I, I'm running into that too. I see particularly in the teenage Asperger boys, the mother will speak up and I will think, let him speak, let him speak for himself. Mm-hmm. And I see that conflict and he doesn't know how to handle it and she doesn't know how to handle it. No, the, but the consequences the, are that that person is later in leaving home um, may have a lot of anxiety about independence. And, oh. and mom also has a huge gap in her life if that person leaves home. Absolutely. She, then she really has no identity because the identity mm. with her child, the merging with her child has become her identity. And now the child would like to go ahead and have his own life. Yes. And so that causes lost. great heartache for all concerned. Uh, I never know how much to to talk about that whether is that to help to people to understand that that may be going on do you think it is a help i I think it needs to be recognized and and to ask the, the mother to realize that that to be a successful parent you must encourage increasing independence and that when that person makes mistakes or is very upset it's a learning experience rather than a tragedy Ah, that's a nice point. Yes, for both. Yes. Because we all learn all our life. Yes. Uh, You said you you were going to talk a little bit about Asperger's and depression. I think you were going to. Yes, you're right. Uh, That and and a couple of other things. But let's, uh, what I wanted before we got into, into depression, I wanted to bring out the, the Asperger trait of that, Asperger's are very aware of themselves, but are they aware in relation to others? Uh, The website, what I want to know is, are we, this goes with the mother problem. The Spectrum websites tend to focus on ways the community can help the Asperger's individuals. Government entitles Asperger's, Aspies to social security. Are we creating a protective cocoon of enablement? 
that's what I was after. A cocoon that reinforces Asperger unawareness to the point of arrogance. Yes, it, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's also fostering dependence and, and disability. I would like to, to switch it the other way around. Rather than from how can society help someone with Asperger's, how can someone with Asperger's help society? And that may be in volunteer work. It could be in guidance and teaching and so on. And that builds the person with Asperger's self-esteem and self-value. It's one of the wonderful antidotes to depression. So I would rather switch it the other way. How can the Aspie characteristics be constructively used and valued in the community? I Well, I like that because that... that that's why I put that in about obligation, responsibility. What you're, you're more eloquent. You got right to the point. You said it is how do how do how does the aspie give to us? Yes, they have a great deal to give. Yes, and what I find interesting is if I've got a if I've got a problem, the person with Asperger's approaches me with great wisdom, patience, and eloquence in, for example, explaining my computer. Or, or a photograph <laughs> or something oh, like that. Yeah. And I think, wow, your teaching skills are extraordinary and you're incredibly patient with me. And uh, I would like to bring out more of that. That's truly valuable. I have sitting beside me here Mike Beeferman, who's not Asperger, but I couldn't, I'd be helpless. I would not be able to talk to you halfway around the world if Mike wasn't here. Uh, <laughs> He's laughing at me. I don't know whether he'll let him. I'll let him show his face. But, okay, uh, but again, but, he, and he's incredibly patient. And it requires something like the internet for certainly all of us who did not grow up with it. Hmm. Requires enormous patience to okay. understand think, its ramifications. Okay. If I take this just just very briefly to another point, ASD is designed, or should we say, defined by deficits, what the person does that's not as good as a typical person their age. I would like to switch it around. And, and what do they do that's better than other people? So in other words, it's defined by its positive characteristics rather than negative characteristics. And I think that will change I, perception. I, I, yeah. I, and, and well, this also points to something that's, that is the romanticizing of autism and Asperger Rather than putting it at the level you're putting it, where where can they contribute? There, people are acting as though they have some extraordinary gift uh, that's beyond all the rest of us poor, humble human beings, and uh, it distorts the picture. Because then mothers say to me, "Well, where's the gift for my child?" Yeah. And they're not able to look at the level that you're talking about. They're yeah. They're, they're pushing it to an extreme. Yes. In other words, my child has autism. What's his savant characteristic going to be? Yes. And, and I it, say, yeah. what, what we need to do is just look at that. The person's profile of abilities, strengths and weaknesses. So it's balanced. But I also want to explore as a clinician their personality. Who are they underneath the ASD? Who would they have been if they didn't have ASD? And some of the kids would have been quite cheeky and mischievous. And uh, other kids would have been very angelic. Uh, but that characteristic is still there. Well, it gives them a kind of maturity. That's what you're pointing out. Yeah. Because they've had to struggle yes. consciously while the rest of us can talk to each other without having to think about it. They've yes. had to think yes. about it. Yes, that's why I say people with ASD are incredibly brave yes. in what they have to face up to. But the fact that they do face up to it means highly intelligent. Yes, and a tenacity, which is extraordinary. Yes. Uh, now, yes, this business about, I, I'm puzzled by the, it's coming up now, wait a minute, uh, it was, do they want to be themselves? Do they want, uh, oh yes, here it is. Uh, Aspies have their own social network and websites. Rather than joining us, do some of the Aspies prefer 
to create an identity apart from us. Why am I uh, confused by websites that are just for Asperger's? What's going on? Oh, okay, I, I was born and brought up in England and now live in Australia. And so my original culture was British. Now that means that quite often in Australia, I have a group of British friends because they're part of my culture, but they're not my exclusive friends. Because when I'm with those friends, I can talk about my childhood and British politics and all those sorts of things, and we have a common language. But it's not an exclusive club. I have Australian friends, New Zealand friends, and so on. So I think it's just opening up a range of people. But one of the bases of friendship is someone of like mind or like experience, like experiences, but also can give you wisdom because of their own experiences. And I think what I see those web pages are is an opportunity for friendship and wisdom. Oh, that's nice. Uh, it also points to the fact that we're, we're tribal creatures. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, what you're saying is you move back to the tribe of Britain where you grew up. I moved back mm -hmm. into Boston. I live in New York and I've lived here most of my life. But I was yes. raised in the, in the New England world. And that's my yes. tribe. Yes, and I see Temple as one of the wise elders of the tribe. Yes, she is. Yes, hmm. she is. Um, I have a comment from someone. They said Asperger's is no longer a diagnosis. Now it's just the autism spectrum disorder or social communication disorder. So now what? That's what they said. So how, can you respond to that, either one, both? Of okay, you? I, I can respond. Um, uh, and that is that quite simply is giving too much power to DSM-5. Uh, you can't take away Asperger's syndrome. It's part of the general conversation. It, it, it's like saying we've got to get rid of Alzheimer's because of, it's named after a person. Um, I think you can't remove in a textbook what is common knowledge and has been incredibly valuable for a whole range of people. I still will use it and I think we will continue to use it despite DSM-5. Hurrah. I agree. <laughs> uh, she also had uh, the, the person who said that, she said, I agree, but ignoring this is causing a problem for those who need social skills, etc. I agree. Um, not sure exactly what she means on that. Diana, you'll have to explain a little bit more on what you need on that, what you mean by that. But go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to get the questions in as they're coming so they're not, you don't have to go backwards. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Are we... Keep going. Uh, just, shall we just keep going? Keep well, going. I, okay, I, I'd like yeah. to go back to uh, what I was saying before you came before when we were waiting for your arrival. Uh, and that is, I, I feel there's something, it, it's not just the genes. We studied the genes, and yes, I'm sure there's genetic um, information comes from the genes. But what triggers them? What turns them on? Why are you and I able to talk to each other halfway around the world? And why... Is this why is there this social gap for the this, this struggle for those, particularly we're talking about Asperger's today? What it seems to me what's missing is the connection. Why are we not looking for the trigger? What's what connects us? Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I, what it means uh, is you, you can have they're a, an animal, just to, that that's okay. what I told them about that uh, animals react to their young. They have a trigger right. response to each other. We okay. Do too. Okay. If we take it that there are known genes for alcoholism, but not everyone with that gene becomes alcoholic. Uh -huh. So there's a number of factors that may change or, should we say, amplify some of those characteristics. So I think um, this is my own thoughts. One of the components of autism we're becoming aware of is the increasing likelihood of having an ASD child with older parents. Yes. 
And, and so I think part of the, a part reason why we have more ASD kids is people are delaying having children. Yes, you're not the only one think, I've said that. that so I, one of the factors yeah. is parental age is a yeah. factor. Yeah. There's also in modern society a huge increase in not only diabetes, but also eczema and a whole range of conditions that are much more common than they ever used to be. So there's something about our modern society that may be triggers for ASD that trigger off the characteristics in those with the genetic predisposition. So I think it's something we need to explore, but I think it's something that, that must be explored. Well, and maybe I'm not being clear, what I'm talking about is uh, the, the response that's taking place between, between the two of us right now and it seems to be where there is, it's most difficult for those on the spectrum in some yeah. degree. What is, and, and we can see that it's in animal life, and it must be therefore in our life, but it seems to be missing or it's incomplete. That's what I'm, yeah. in, what, what, why, what is leaving it incomplete? Why are we not looking for that? connection well you Stacia, i think you ought to be the person handing out the money for the research grants because i think that's what you need to do um it, it's why is it not being complete if i go back to what i said earlier for some people it does become complete and they are able to solve the social puzzle but what i find that when they do they use an enormous amount of emotional and mental energy which we don't give them credit for for their social success. I agree. So I agree. there are two ways to acquire a skill, uh, intuition or instruction. And I think what happens is that you say it may be an incomplete neural structure that may be completed by guidance and support, but there is still a lot of effort that goes into that socializing. And the closer you are to that success, the higher the expectations. And so I see some with Asperger's who can be a life and soul of the party for several hours, but at the end of that have the equivalent of a social migraine, and the next day is an absolute wipeout. So that they've achieved it, but by a different pathway that's involved a lot of other parts of the brain taking over those skills. It's, it's exhausting. It is exhausting, and, and this, I think, is very typical of little children when they first start school, middle school, talking about, and, and the teacher would say, well, he was wonderful all day at school. Well, he comes home, he's exhausted, and he falls apart. Yes. And it lands on the family, and the family said, well, he's, he, he can't, they can't believe that, the, that their child was just fine all day in school. Yes, Maybe not the but life of the party, of but certainly contributing to the whole day at school. Yes, I, I think we what we tend not to do as adults is recognise how challenging social situations are to children in general. Yes, because there is so much going on that is language processing, facial expressions, body language, social conventions, um, and also learning. No wonder kids are exhausted uh, after a school day, but especially with the social side. Yes, I think so. And now you're bringing up something that I in, don't know how to parse yet. That is our culture. We have now the internet culture, what we, you and I are using right now, which is miraculous. And I, you have to remember, I grew up at, when we didn't have television. And the miracle of television, yes. which you yep. grew up with. Yeah. Uh, th this is the extraordinary changes. And the fact that you can Google anything and get an answer has led people to feeling that there are answers. And, and it's resulted that there are aspects of our culture that are complicated and shallow as a result. And I'm curious about how does that affect are us? How does it affect our young? How does it affect the way we look at our young? Probably all our young, and what? It, and what are they? What's the world they're growing into? 
I think that a lot of Asperger kids are very good at the computer, probably better than most of us. But it's not a life. You cannot make virtual reality is not reality. Okay. Um, can I take that? Yes, I think that's a, a society issue we need to cover. But if I take that to Asperger's, when you're on the computer, you are not in physical contact with someone. If you want to stop the conversation, you can just say the line was down rather than I don't want to talk to you, go away. And often it can be typing, not talking. And so you don't have the major difficulties that you have. I say sometimes on the Internet, if you've got Asperger's, you found the cure because you don't have to worry about what clothes you wear and you can exchange pure information. And so for many, it becomes addictive. And my concern here is the amount of time they're spending. So, for example, some with Asperger's who may not like who they are and have a negative view of themselves can create an avatar or a, an alternative personality on the computer that is so intoxicatingly enjoyable, it becomes addictive. And so I see those with Asperger's who are trying to socialize, but their view is, I don't need to because I've got all my needs met in front of a screen. And I think that's spreading over into everybody because I get on the elevator here in the apartment where I live, and we used to say good morning to each other. Now everybody's got a little gadget in their hand, and they're tweaking it and poking it and maybe listening to something. We're none of us in the present moment in the way no, we uh, to be. When, yeah, and when I talk to uh, elementary school teachers today, mm -hmm. they often say children of today are more socially immature than they were years ago at the same age. Interesting. Because they've not spent so much time socializing with each other. And so they don't know how to socialize with each other. No. That also no, brings up the problem of special classes. I'm not... I, Temple was mainstreamed by five. She was had a a teacher, she couldn't speak when she, when she was two, when I first took her to the doctor. And he recommended speech lessons. And it took her until she was nearly five to learn to talk. And she was mainstreamed by five into the local kindergarten in the little school where everybody in the neighborhood went to the school. Hmm. And people have said to me, well, did she have special classes? No, she had to kind of struggle with what everybody else was struggling with. Uh, if we give, if we put children into separate classes, into special classes, how are they going to learn to live life? Mm -hmm. I, I, think that's, I think that's very true. I'm going to, to, to turn another dimension to that and say often the problem is the attitude and knowledge of the peer group. Well, of, yeah. see, Temple's group accepted her and we had a rule with with her teacher of if, if there was a day that temple couldn't manage could she go home and i said yes of course she would use those days to talk to the rest of the class and explain to them about temple and certain yes. problems she had and they could help with it and you know what they did help and yes. what i love is temple is 67 now and there are a whole lot of that whole little group who are all 67 they feel they had a hand in raising temple. Yes. And, and I think it's that commitment to the person rather than rejection is, is crucial for success in social integration in an ordinary classroom. So it's not just can the curriculum be modified. My view is, are the children understanding and accepting and encouraging of that child? And that's the crucial, I think, ingredients for success. Yes. And I think they do. I don't think children judge. I think they learn to judge as they learn a lot of other things. Yes. Uh, but how do you get, you see, that works best in private schools. And my contention is I think that private schools are going to have to lead the way in uh, 
presenting new ways of looking at education, getting us out of the educational rut we're in right now. No, and I think so. We need to. Yes. They will come yeah. from private schools. Well, I think schools that have the greater flexibility to do well, that. They, well, that the the private school has more yeah. flexibility. Yeah. And can therefore uh, reach out and establish better ways of teaching all children. Yes, I'm going to jump in here. Oh, yes, get, just about schools and, and because I do a lot of work in schools as you do, Tony, and, and I think coaching the teachers in the moment is the, where it's really crucial. I worked with a little boy with cerebral palsy and he was blind and the teacher had a rule that when she said change, everybody had to get to the next place in two minutes. And I said, no, you, he can't do that. There's no way he can get there in two minutes. And she said, well, then it won't work. And I said, you know, everybody needs to learn to wait for him because it's okay to wait for people. And yes. so you just had to coach her in the moment and say, that's unreasonable. You're just not going to wait for someone. If someone's struggling to get to the bus, you're just going to say, sorry, the bus has got to go. You need to learn to wait. It's okay to wait for someone. So I think being in the moment with teachers, and we don't have enough people going out and doing that, you know, walking into a classroom and really coaching teachers in the moment. That's it. We just wanted to throw that in. Yes, so. I think it, it's very important and, and issues of courtesy and understanding too. Now, I think we were going to talk a little bit about depression. Was that one of the topics yes, to talk yes, about? Yes, it's on the list, yes. Can you talk about it? What's up? Okay, I, I would like to talk about it because I see uh, it, it's difficult enough coping with, with ASD, um, but one of the problems can be depression. And when I start to explore this, I find those with ASD – have great difficulty expressing their inner thoughts and feelings, self-reflection. And when they're very down, I try and work out what's going through their mind when they are feeling so down. And I, when I find out, I find that it, it's not what parents have said or done or teachers have said or done. It's the peer group can lay the seeds for subsequent depression of low self-esteem, in some ways you're defective, et cetera. And when the kids are very young, they then start to believe that. For example, many with ASD value intelligence very highly. And the other kids will know that's your sensitive point, making a mistake. So when you make a mistake, they'll say, oh, you're stupid. But of course, subsequently, if you make a mistake, it proves they were right. So I'm very concerned about the attitude of others in creating a sense of depression. And so I have people with Asperger's who are so depressed, they can't get out of their bedroom. Um, they can't have the initiative to do various things because of that deep depression. And that's what I want to explore more about in the future. How much is that in the culture? We have a culture that's that's very violent right now. Uh, and we have movies, video games, television that cheers on violence of one form or another. And what you're suggesting, what leaps to my mind when you're doing is that's that's a verbal violence on another it person. It is. And in modern society, violence, well, when Temple was a child, it was the usual cowboy movies. And when you were shot, you just fell down. But there wasn't all the carnage that is shown today, yes. which kids will pick up very early on. And it's almost sort of legitimizing that the words are not significant, when in fact they are highly significant in developing self-esteem. And many with, with ASD feel that they're not different, they're defective in some way. And so I try and work in encouraging their self-belief. How, how do you help them get out of it? Uh, well, there are a number of ways. Well, for example, if there's comments by the, the other kids, we call those poisonous thoughts. So we look for an antidote to a poisonous thought. But another thing that we actually find is incredibly valuable in alleviating depression is physical exercise. But many with ASD like sedentary activities. 
And that's not good. They're often clumsy, so they don't engage in sporting activities. They're not so good at team sports, so at lunchtime they may not be involved with that. So we, we find that the most effective actual treatment for depression is not Prozac, it's not psychotherapy, it's physical exercise. Oh, I, I agree. I think we all experience that. Get up, move around. Yeah. Our brains work uh, better that way. And I think you just said, you stated an important point. The brain works better. So I explained to the guys, it'll make you happier, but it'll also make you smarter. Yes. And that yeah. will make you happier. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I think it, it's really looking at, at, at the life experiences of the person. We, we define ASD, but it's the person traveling through life and the experiences that they have may determine their degree of success, perhaps sometimes more so than the depth of ASD. That's a lovely thought. Mm. Uh, I am still troubled by our culture. Mm. And particularly for the teenagers, uh, teenage boys, how do they handle themselves? How do they handle themselves with girls? Eustacia, uh, excuse me, this is a great way you're going, but I did have a question, um, and yes. it's someone, uh, Brian Clark, asked this question. You want to know, how do you feel about the idea of schools having a particular day or a comprehensive lesson centered around a variety of disabilities? And they often do that in schools, and I, that would be interested in, in what Tony thought about that, where the whole school spends a day experiencing different disabilities do you think that um that we make this person wants to know make significant improvements in children's social interactions with those with asd if they did that type of activity okay if when that occurs not to be a lecture but to actually experience it so in other words for that day you've got to be in a wheelchair for that day you've got to be blind for asd for that day other people are going to wear a mask so you can't read their facial expressions. Um, and so it, it's really, I think, for kids to understand it, they've got to experience it. So it's creating a series of games and activities so you will have that disability, whatever it may be. And actually, once you've experienced it, you're going to have much more compassion. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, you stay, I didn't mean to interrupt you, and I hope you can get back onto where you were going. Uh, oh, well, I think I was moving into the teenage yes, problem, you were. the social problems of the teenage and of the boys meeting girls. How, what's your, what's your take on all of that? Okay, I think there, yes, we've got the issue of friendship, but we've also got the issue of sexuality. That's the word and I'm hoping what you'd say. Is, is the the person with ASD physically will have puberty the same age as their peers, but may not have their first romantic experiences for another 10 years or more. And so if I go from my own personal uh, issues here for the clients that I see, sometimes they're not getting the romantic experiences. So they go to the internet and television, which doesn't provide good models of sexuality and relationships and so they then get all sorts of information as to what to do from um, uh, videos to go with pop films etc right the way through to pornography which is not a documentary of, of relationships and so i am concerned of the information they're getting is not in the right context and can lead to all sorts of issues but I also find that within ASD, there's a much higher proportion than we would expect who are asexual. That is that they're not interested in an intimate relationship with anyone. But their peer group then say, you must be gay. If you are not looking as a boy at girls' legs and breasts, then obviously you're gay. And that leads to all sorts of confusion with information from their peers, which can be quite damaging and derogatory. And I think that's, that spreads over to almost all young people. Yes. 
we again along with the violence in our culture we have a sexual culture mm. and it's confusing it's funny as you were saying that i thought of long ago when i was in college i remember studying under eric erickson and mm. he was talking about identity and i had gone back to college later in years so i was older than the other students and Erickson made a point of always going to any of the uh, groups. Uh, it, at Harvard, they do have the system where you listen to the big professor twice a week, and then the third session is a section where there are never more than maybe 14 people. So they were very personal, these sections. And Erickson always went to one of them. And uh, we walked across the yard together, and he said to me, all of these young people, the first question they ask is about the course. The second question is always about themselves. And part of it is just what you're describing. They haven't yet grown up into their identity. Mm -hmm. And they're trying for intimacy. And it may not be the right way to be trying for it. Yes. And they're, that's why they're questioning me. And the result was... Erickson's course was so popular at Harvard that they couldn't fill all, there wasn't room enough in any lecture hall to yeah. handle it all. So you had to write a little essay about why you thought you deserved to be in the class. <laughs> <laughs> everybody wanted to go to it. Yes. Because everybody was struggling with the same problem. Yes, it's a, it's a universal problem. It will always continue. Yes, it will. Uh, it's just that those for ASD have greater challenges because one of their issues is they're not very good at what I call character judgments. That is taking on board what someone says, not their personality or intentions. Yes. And so my concern, in, in fact, my concern in life actually is not ASD, it's other people. It's not <laughs> ASD itself. It's what other people will do to damage or corrupt them. Yes. Or, and, and it's also the confused leading the confused. Yes. And so I, I do feel that, that t today's adolescence is difficult for teenagers throughout the world anyway. But for those with ASD, with a, a poorer concept of self, socially confusing and exhausting, not sure of what's the right thing to do socially, um, trying to copy what they see others do, but yes. not in the right context. Exactly. And they see what's on the films and then put it into real life Action. and it goes wrong. <laughs> it doesn't work. No. Wait a second. I think we have to bring this to a close. I can't bear to, to let go of you. But we have agreed that we will write to each other. And the, whatever we write will also get posted on this uh, website. And Uta Frith has said she would like to write stuff. So let us all contribute. And I loved your idea, Tony. You said when we first spoke of this, you said, oh, then we can each have a chapter. We'll put it all into a book. I think we should. But yeah. also, you say, you say, it's, it's your mind as well is sharp and insightful. So what I would like to be is invited to come back again to do oh, another I one love in that. 2015. I love that. Yes. And here's your family. Oh, and oh, also yeah. your book flashed on there for a minute. I have to put on my glasses so I can see your family. Oh, this yes, is that, that's, that's my wife, Sarah, daughter, yes. Rosie. Rosie is a teacher of autistic children in an early intervention service. And our granddaughter, Alice. Oh, uh, how lovely. Well, mm -hmm. please come back. And I don't care how long it takes you to get connected. We will be connected. Okay, and I think next time it will be. Again. <laughs> and and we, be can, we can figure out some other things that we think would be good to talk about. Yes, and if people have got any questions or topics, let's do that. Okay. Thank you so much.